or now it's okay because you're older and you kind of understand why anger gets out of control or whatever, uh, and you can handle it better and it doesn't hurt you maybe quite as much because you've experienced it more. That's just, um, that's just a cultural construct. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Bible says that you're not to hang around angry people. Uh, the Bible says that it's a sin to get angry unless it's, you know, righteous anger. Welcome, Phil Good Fathers. Today we're in part two conversation with Fred. Uh, our quote that we're going to start off with is to be rather than to seem. Uh, Fred, let's kind of continue our conversation from last time. So let's go deeper into this quote and what it means to you. Yeah, well, what it means to me is that, um, you know, when we're saved, we aren't 100% acting like Christ uh, the moment we're saved. And there is a process, the Bible says, of working out our salvation so that we do then look like Christ, act like Christ, and uh, we don't act the same way we always used to. So uh, I always felt like that statement to be rather than to seem, if I had a family crest, that would be on my family crest because that's been the center of everything I've done with my family, helping us to stand strong, teaching my children to be rather than just seem like Christians by, you know, you, you, you get to seem like a Christian just by going to youth group or just by going to church um, and maybe putting a bumper sticker on your car. That's useless. That means nothing. Uh, the only thing that means anything is being like Christ. And uh, that's what it means to me. This is really evocative of the theme of internal versus external worlds. and so. Many of the examples that you provided were these external activities that you could take on, this concept of uh, of showing up in the way. And there's a handful of different thought thoughts here. For instance, so, you know, fake it till you make it, that kind of jazz, showing up and then eventually become. But really, it seems like what you're <laughs> really it seems like what you're kind of pointing at is that, you know, when we're we were talking about sexual purity last time. Today, we're going to have a, a couple of really great conversations um, particularly about anger and then about about men's communities that really you're talking about the internal game. You're talking about the what's most important yeah. is that inside you're right. Um, and in specific, like inside you're right with Christ. So what is that? Let's keep going there. Yeah, well, a, a second, I mean, if you were to sit my four kids down, they would tell you, uh, you know, the second most common statement that I would make in my home is that we need to live from the inside out, not from the outside in. So we're not taking our cues from culture. We're not taking our cues from our friends. Uh, we're taking our cues from the internal soul that we've built through reading the Bible, worship, whatever. In my case, uh, old, I'm older, so I do some fasting. I didn't ask my kids to do that when they were young, obviously, but. Um, I feel like uh, if we're living from the inside out, we're living from that being a Christian. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, that internal that internal space, uh, when you have that right, then your reactions are correct. Uh, and they're more in line with Christ. Because again, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. So of course, we're going to have this draw towards holiness, this draw towards righteousness, but we have to continue to keep saying yes to that new life that lives in us. And uh, as long as we keep saying yes, we're moving towards sanctification, we're moving towards being Christ-like. Uh, as we maybe live externally, we are saying no to that new life that lives in us, and that's tragic. I mean, it, 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 it's just a mess in terms of then you being consistent in front of your children. Uh, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but uh, the verse that means the most to me as a Christian is the verse in the Bible, uh, and I'm talking about being a father. It's the one that talks about not driving your children to wrath. I have spent a ton of time on, on that, thinking about it, meditating on it, praying about it, because I think that's the key scripture 
in the Bible when it comes to parenting, even though very few other people would probably call that the key scripture. But one of the things that I understand about that scripture is that um, the way we drive our children to wrath primarily is through hypocrisy. And when we're not living from the inside out, when we're we're asking them to do things that we're not asking ourselves to do, or we're expecting them to stay in boundaries that we won't stay inside. Um, that drives them to wrath. And eventually they can literally turn away from God and, and uh, blow the whole thing off. So, you know, so this is as we've been talking about this this morning, you can kind of see how it all fits together when it comes that consistency, that internal drive keeps you from driving your kids to wrath and driving them away from Christ. I'm, I'm really kind of reflecting on how how this shows up in the day to day interaction, in the um, large activities, in the time spent directly with your kids and, and specific family activities and, you know, even at the dinner table. You know, what what are the elements as I was growing up where, um, you know, I experienced hypocrisy from a child to to my parents? You know, what are the ways that but most importantly, as as the father now, what are the parts where I am not showing up, where I am not living with with my, um, you know, with with my intention, with my integrity? And so one of the the core tenets of like the Twining House is. Um, if you make a mess, you clean it up. So there's an idea of like taking responsibility yes. and ownership yes. of everything around you. And um, and then I'm reflecting on like, oh, there's a handful of times today where that just isn't the case, where I'm not cleaning up my mess, where I'm not, um, where I'm living with a little bit of, you know, I don't know, like I'm, I'm talking about actual mess, like just kind of clutter. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. and I think yeah. that's, I think that this really ties into something we were talking about off air, which was intentionality. And so what are the ways that intentionality really shows up for you as the father and the husband? And um, what are, I, I think most importantly for our feel good father listeners, what are the sort of, I, I think like the traps, like common traps that the external world is saying, Hey, it's okay for you to do that. That, in our, you know, to tie everything together, that our internal work of being rather than seeming is going to create that juxtaposition yeah. and create that that dissonance uh, with us, which is going to create frustration. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest traps is that when you're an adult, uh, you are more able to handle sin, and so you can do whatever you want as opposed to some of the limits you're putting on your kids. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm teaching my children that uh, sexual content in a show, it might be as simple as Little Mermaid and, you know, the mm -hmm. old sea witch scene, that sensual thing. Um, I, I sat them down and said, look, this is wrong. I explained to them why it was wrong. Um, and they accepted that it made sense to them scripturally it made sense to them what i was saying but then what if the next week they saw me watching a movie that had sexual content and it come down to maybe get a drink of water they see that and uh, what is that telling them that that's number one number two is if it is unholy for my kids to watch that for instance why is it holy for me just because i'm an adult I mean, the Bible is very clear. Uh, we are not to have even a hint of sexual immorality in our lives. So one of the more consistent things that, you know, Brenda and I established is that if something pollutes our children, it pollutes us as adults as well. And we need to be very careful to be consistent on that sort of a thing. Here's another one um, that, uh, you know, we, we, say that it's wrong for our children to scream at each other or to yell at each other. But then we as adults, uh, we scream and yell at each other and just say, well, you know, that's marriage and you'll understand someday. Um, no, that's hypocrisy and that's stupid. And so uh, the way that Brenda and I always established things was that, I mean, if we're going to teach our children 
to be kind, not to scream at each other and to have a peaceful home, then we have to be living by those same standards ourselves. And a lot of times what we do is it's no different from the movie standards. You know, there's a PG and then there's a PG-13 and then there's R as if you get to a certain age and now you, it's okay for you to watch this stuff. Um, or now it's okay because you're older and you kind of understand why anger gets out of control or whatever, uh, and you can handle it better and it doesn't hurt you maybe quite as much because you've experienced it more. That's just, um, that's just a cultural construct. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Bible says that you're not to hang around angry people. Uh, the Bible says that it's a sin to get angry unless it's, you know, righteous anger. Uh, it's sin to get anger and hurt someone with your anger. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to understand that just because we're in charge doesn't mean that we get to kind of slip the boundaries a little bit. And in my experience, um, what that does for me then is when I'm talking to my kids, when they get into their teens where everything really matters, um, they'll listen to my advice because they know I'm not a hypocrite. They know that I'm not going to be teaching them something that I wouldn't live myself. And it keeps my voice loud in their lives when there's no hypocrisy. I mean, hypocrisy shuts down your voice. Your kids won't listen to you anymore. And that is a primary goal as fathers is to make sure that your voice is still loud in their ears because they respect you. Does I that really, make sense? Uh, yeah, that does. And, and I, I like the, um, I like the examples that we've discussed. You sort of went down a path that um, I think is really important to understand. It's some of the first that I've heard of it, but just in the, the definition of the Bible is how, uh, how men are supposed to react without anger. And then as you were discussing that, I was thinking about Seneca's letters, letters on the passions, and he talks about on anger. And so there's a translated letter that he has, uh, Stoicism being one of the philo other philosophies that I, I read up and touch up on as well. Okay. And um, that was, and I was thinking about the connection there, but I hadn't heard it from the biblical perspective. But I think, you know, even for our, you know, um, uh, our secular audience, right? Let's, um, because there's going to be some of, some of our feel good fathers here that are that there's, yes, um, sure. there's a perspective here on what is appropriate levels of anger and what is not. And so I want to have two, two core elements here. Number one, let's define righteous anger. Let's, let's define that term. And then the second being, I'd really like to kind of have some examples that we would see in the world of where this would show up. And maybe we can have a discussion about where it's showing up for each of us in our life about this inappropriate anger. And, um, and then I'd really like to drive it home into um, kind of what we're actually talking about was how are we as the fathers of the house? How are we showing up intentionally for our wives? How are we showing up intentionally for our kids? Um, and then I'll kind of wrap up that thought. Cause there's a, I think there's an interesting path we can go here. Yeah, when you talk about righteous anger, um, I mean, <laughs> again, I'm older, Jay, so, you know, I'm 66. I'm not going to try to hide it. I've got gray hair, all that. Um, and and in, in my, the longer you live, the more you see certain things. And when we talk about righteous anger, uh, a lot of times people use that to kind of give themselves, again, a slip out of the boundaries. They go, oh, okay, well, well, that was righteous because, you know, that was against God's law or whatever. And in reality, you blew up, you hurt your wife's feelings deeply or your kid's feelings deeply in a way that they won't forget for two years or whatever. And um, the big thing I want to say about righteous anger is just simply this. I mean, if you are angry because of something someone in the culture says or does that stands against God's kingdom, uh, of course, uh, you should be angry at that. Um, that's something that you need to fight against and to stand up against so that you can advance God's kingdom. Um, when it comes to the home, um, there's not much righteous about anger at all. 
Um, I mean, I remember when uh, Brenda and I were first married, for instance, um, I was angry a lot uh, because my expectations weren't being met. Um, I had spent tons of time throughout my whole life. I mean, my life's dream was to have a successful marriage. I, you probably never heard anybody say that. I mean, most people want to grow up to be a fireman or a policeman or heck, even a pirate, who knows? Uh, but for me, I wanted to grow up to be a great, great husband with a marriage that lasts. Why? Well, I was raised in a broken home and it crushed me. I was in fifth grade when it all came down. And, uh, you know, I even chose my college major based on the fact that I wanted to learn about love, learn about human relationships. I studied sociology, graduated with honors at Stanford. So, I mean, I really dug into it. Well, then I got married in my heavens, um, trying to live with another human being and build something stable. Uh, I mean, first of all, you're married to a woman. There's the gender differences. Then there's uh, the differences between Oh, just our temperaments. Uh, like if there's a problem, I tend to address it and face it right away. She tends to retreat to the couch and read a book. Well, that looked that looked weak to me, uh, but it was just different. It wasn't weak. Um, it was just a different reaction. And so anyway, all these things began to happen. And I, I mean, I remember one time, for instance, she she didn't really know how to wash clothes when we got married. Uh, and so she turned all my white dress shirts pink. She she washed them with some red things. And so I right in front of her, I tore all my shirts to shreds and just lost complete control. And uh, I mean, it frightened her right down to her toes. There were times where I punched holes in the drywall and uh, just to terrify her. And, you know, obviously there's nothing righteous about that. Uh, what I was trying to do is establish control, Jay. And I always thought that husbands, it was all about leadership and control in the same sense that with a high school football coach, the buck stops with him. If he tells you to run 10 laps, you do it. Okay. And as a husband, I thought that was my role. What well, It really wasn't. And what began to happen was with that anger and with trying to get my expectations met, I was tearing the core of Brenda apart. I wasn't giving her gifts a chance to blossom. I wasn't giving her a chance to blossom. Uh, I wasn't making any room for her weaknesses whatsoever. And so when I talk about anger in the home, I'm talking about, for instance, not being humble and not making sure that everyone in your home has room to blossom and grow without being tormented by your anger. I mean, that's the sort of the path that I took when it came to thinking about that. This this is really evocative, I think, of the common conception and misconception of what um, what the roles are in the house. And yes, I think, I of think you're right. Whenever, whenever, and I think this is a lot of, you know, when we think about the culture war, this is really what we're talking about. And I think there's so many, the pendulums are so like the, the extreme ends of the pendulum are just not really worth talking about. But what really is, is we're talking about is like, what's the path forward and what's the optimum path for the feel good father moving forward to construct um, and contribute to the best house forward. And the way that, you know, the way that I've been thinking about it, and um, and this is from years ago, uh, my friend, Michael Sparrow, one of my first mentors uh, when I was in my young 20s, uh, he told me this this concept. And so I hope the attribution there for the internet forever and ever is, is appropriately made, um, that there's three people uh, in a Christian house, there's four people, but there's three entities that you have to maintain a relationship with. The first is with yourself. The second is with yeah. your wife and the third is with the relationship. Um, and then if you're a Christian, it's with God, right? So that's the fourth entity in the relationship. And so what that creates um, for all parties, and I think this is, um, I'm not sure if we talked about, I know I've talked about with some other Christian men in um, on the show about the, the second Peter uh, things about submission, that kind of jazz. Um, really got to yes. get a, a Christian, got, really got to get a, a nice Christian uh, woman on the show to kind of talk about her perspective on all this kind of stuff. But the whole idea from the, I think, from the father's perspective is that there's a sense of, um, as we're talking about it here, there's a sense of what is the intention? What am I trying to bring? When is, what is outside the bounds of really 
really what you're pointing at is a open, peaceful, loving relationship that has longevity to it. Because ultimately, yeah, I mean, you, go ahead. Yeah, you could tell. I mean, that's what I always wanted. And so, yeah, that's the key. And I always thought that the way to do that is through, you know, strong headship, so to say. Mm. Uh, you're familiar with the verse about men are the head of their wives um, and how it's most commonly mm, interpreted. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to Paul's day, uh, that term head mean, meant something quite different back in the Greece, uh, Grecian culture than it does today. I mean, today mm. we talk about things like head of state a head football coach, that sort of a thing. And we all know what that means. Like I said earlier, the buck stops here. They get to have the final say. They break yeah. all the ties in their favor, right? Okay, so, but when you look at what it meant in the original Greek, uh, see the Greeks, they didn't believe that our minds, uh, they didn't believe that the head was the center of life like we do. Uh, we know that all our decisions are made in the brain, all those sorts of things. For them, uh, the center of the being, uh, in some ways was what they called the heart. I mean, life was centered in the head in the sense that when you cut off the head, you die, but, uh, they didn't think of the head like we do. I mean, what Paul was actually saying was that we are to be the heart in our homes, the heart of our wives, in a sense, uh, we are to guide them sacrificially. We are to do everything we can, like Christ did, to provide life uh, and development and thriving. Uh, and that's a completely different mindset than head. Uh, with head, there's a there's kind of a mindset of governance um, and getting to make the decisions. When you talk about head from the Grecian idea, you're talking about uh, not headship from a governing standpoint, but uh, headship from a life source standpoint. Okay, so when Paul did say head, um, what the Greeks saw that as the life source, uh, because again, when you cut off the head, the life ends. And so what Paul was saying is that we as husbands, we as leaders, we need to be the life source of our home. Uh, like Christ was the life source of the church. And when we start seeing our role from that perspective, I can tell you everything changed. I remember talking to a pastor when I was having some real difficult marriage problems in my first couple of years because of my poor leadership. And he took me to Ephesians 521, which talks about mutual submission, which I never heard of. I'd always just heard about women submitting to male leadership. And um, that is more in line with what Paul meant, uh, that we are to, we are to sacrifice. We are to focus on learning about our wives so that we can know what their gifts are and make sure there's room for them to blossom. And we are to be that life source by living in a Christ-like way, not angry all the time, and not being focused only on our own expectations, but making sure her expectations are met. So you mentioned the word open. Uh, that's kind of the more common cultural way of us talking about an open relationship. But from a biblical standpoint, uh, instead of saying open, uh, we could use the phrase life source or the word life source because mm -hmm. I think that means the same thing. But in some ways, it's a better description of what we as leaders, as men, as husbands need to provide. And I think I think in, 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 on on this simple thing because we're talking about terms here. I think open would be the inappropriate term because that means something different. I think what I it what I was trying be. to, yeah. yeah, what I what I meant was creating space. And yes, um, exactly. Very good, Jay. I, I really like that word. That's a yeah, creating space, creating room. Um, you have to remember before Brenda married me, um, she had complete freedom. To exercise her gifts in Christ in any way she wanted. She had complete freedom to spend her money any way she wanted. She had just complete freedom in Christ. As soon as she got married, I clamped down. I essentially, it was worse to live with me than it was to live in her home growing up. And mm -hmm. so uh, that is not 
what marriage is supposed to be. What marriage is supposed to be is it's supposed to be better than the home of origin. What um, let's get let's get into some solutions here because I think we've we've done a really great job I think of articulating the consequence of hypocrisy. We have certainly talked about the consequence of wrath as we understand it in the as the sin of wrath so anger in the the common parlance what are some straightforward let's talk about some mindsets let's talk about perspectives in thinking about our relationship with our wives we've talked a little bit about how hypocrisy and how there's a when we have a word when we have a way of being or we have a, a motto or a value or a principle that our kids are looking for us to show that integrity. They're looking for us to show the intention of this is the way we want them to be. Almost, almost even saying, these are the standards of this house. This is what it means to be X, right? This is what it means to be a part of this family. Let's talk about um, sort of the healing of this. Um, and maybe we'll hit it from two perspectives. Number one, the healing of ourselves. Because I think that, especially in our context and in our modern context, I think a lot of us feel good fathers. We need to be able to forgive ourselves and give ourselves grace as we've been growing as individuals because we weren't born knowing how to walk. We had to learn that. You're not born knowing how to be a good husband. You have to learn that. You're not born uh, knowing how to control your anger or how to control your lust, which is parts of our conversation. And so, I, I would say I would posit that the first step would be learning how to give yourself space. What yes. what what are your what are sort of your takeaways from this piece? Yeah, well, in my experience, that's been exactly uh, how it's been. I mean, you mentioned earlier our relationship with ourself, our relationship with our wife, uh, with God, uh, obviously with our kids, um, and. What I found, what I found uh, when I'm moving from who I was before I, you know, met Christ to who I've been since, is an awful lot of the change that had to happen was in my relationship with myself. Um, I remember that, uh, you know, growing up, my dad was angry a lot, and he did not accept me as a man. He thought I was weak. Uh, and it it impacted me deeply. And um, just to give you an example of a story from my life, it's probably when I was about 33 or so, uh, suddenly uh, my relationship with my dad and that lack and those father wounds all started to have a really big impact in my life. And I don't really know why it started right then. I suppose there are psychologists out there that could answer that, but all I know is it did. And, and what began to happen was I began to be just really angry, harsh with my kids, harsh with Brenda, harsh, harsh, harsh. And uh, I really didn't know where it was coming from. But about a year into it, Brenda one time just in kind of a brave stand, you know, for the sake of herself and for the sake of her kids. I mean, she basically said, well, then just tell us how long this is going to last so that we can prepare for it. And she just angry, angrily spun on her heel and, you know, stormed out of the master bedroom. And uh, that question was like a, I don't know, like a dagger to my heart. Yeah. You know, I said to myself after she left, I said, you know, how long am I going to be like this? Uh, Ten years? If I could change this in 10 years, uh, just suddenly decide to change it, why can't I change it in five years? And I said, well, if I can change it in five years, why can't I change it in one year? And if I can change it one year from now, why can't I change it today? Mm -hmm. And it suddenly hit me that I had to do something and I had to do it now. So um, I did something that most men never want to do. I, I went to a counselor and he turned out to be a really good one. and. Um, he he took me through some uh, some Viktor Frankl stuff, um, mm -hmm. and he took me through some meaning of life things. And uh, honestly, I began to see my roles differently in my 
connection with my family and all that. But one of the things that was most important that he did was he he told me, Fred, look, uh, I think you're looking at your dad wrong. And he said, I don't think your dad chose not to love you. I think he didn't know how to love you because mm. I had told him, you know, my dad, my dad's dad ran out on that family and left my dad and his seven siblings in the middle of the Great Depression. His mom had no job, uh, just left with another woman. And my dad never had a dad around. My dad was the second youngest, and he didn't know how to be a father. And uh, what Gary was telling me that day was, hey, you know, he just didn't know how. And from that moment on, I suddenly realized, you know what? Yeah, my dad didn't make a decision on this. He did not know how to love me. And I began to feel more pity for him than anger. And uh, then Gary took me to a Promise Keepers event. And uh, Greg Laurie, a lot of people have heard of Greg Laurie. He happened to be the speaker that day. And just some of the things he said that night, it got to this one point in this talk where I literally felt all the pain of my father wounds from all the years just <laughs> fall away. And uh, from that moment on, things were different. I mean, the harshness went away. And you, you say to yourself, well, Fred, didn't you have to learn any techniques? Well, not really. What I had to do is learn to love myself, learn to understand where those father wounds came from and how, and how I how God dealt with them. And it was an instant thing. And a lot of times we we're either through a lack of humility, we look at ourselves and we go, well, I'm not going to go to a counselor. I'm not going to be touchy feely or whatever the stuff men say. Or I'm not going to take this to the Lord. This is just who I am. Uh, my wife will just have to pray about this and have to put up with it. But I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to go out hunting. I'm going to go do the, I'm going to play golf and I'm going to just enjoy my life as best I can. I mean, so we get these really weird thought patterns going instead of saying to ourselves, you know what? Uh, I don't have a great relationship with myself. Uh, there are things in me. I hate me, uh, partly because my dad hated me. And, and so we, one of the things, one of the things that we need to do, as you mentioned earlier, where we, you know, what are some steps we need to take? One of the th steps we need to take, if we need to, is to get counseling uh, mm -hmm. or get mentors, as you mentioned, Jay, and to begin talking deeply about these things we don't want to talk about because they bug us. But once we get that relationship with ourselves healed, a lot of these other things like the lust and the anger begin to fall away. It's, it's really interesting to me. The, a lot of, a lot of our focus as, as men naturally is sort of the, the play and the um, exerting influence over our external environment. And I think yes. what was really interesting here was there were two core elements. Number one, um, we as a generation, so my generation, you know, I'm 42 at the time of this recording. Um, so I'm an 80s kid. I was born in the 80s, the early 80s. Yeah, um, yeah like my kids, yeah. So was was this idea that we we are kind of suffering from, I think, this generational pain, and I think, um, you know, I, I, my parents got divorced when I was very young. It's actually my first memory is my, my biological father walking out of the house. And, um, and so I think, I think that there are more people and I've said, and I said this, I say this frequently. I think there's, there's my experience is not, um, is not abnormal. My experience I think is relatively straightforward and kind of normal, but we I are agree. that, that core relationship there. The first one being with your father. And then his father, his relationship with his father. So your your fam, your familial, your generational relationships. I think that's that's really critical for feel good fathers to understand that um, it's almost incumbent on us to understand what happened there, to have an introspective look, to say, ah, here is a pattern. Here's how this. Here's how my father knew his father. Here's how my father knew me. Here's how I know my children. Um, and I, and. And so there's that that relationship, which is important. But you really pointed to something else I thought was very critical is that your default action in time of crisis, in time of high stress, in time of, um, I would say, impatience would be to go do an activity as a man that is 
by some consider it hiding. It would be the man cave idea. Go playing golf, go do that thing. But it really highlights, I think, the importance of having a really healthy set of men around you and that you yes. have other men that are at different stages of their life that are doing the same kind of work that you're doing. And what I mean by that is not professional. What I mean is they're improving. They're dealing with their thing. Um, they're um, they're dealing with their, their wounds and their hurts. They're trying to make their life better. Let's talk about the importance of having around you the people. We can talk about other relationships. So, you know, we we spent a lot of time today talking about your relationship with your wife as a married couple. Let's talk yes. maybe a little bit about the importance of having other good couples around you. And then let's talk a little bit about um uh the power of the people that are surrounding you, right? The the men the men's group or or whatever other kinds of groups that you surround yourself with. Yes. I'll I'll just give you a few examples of um relationships like that because I think telling the stories help to explain what we're talking about. Um, men always respond better to stories than preaching a logic anyway. Um, when I was in my 20s and I was going first through all these issues with Brenda and then uh, trying to figure out what it meant to be a dad, um, I it would be in the 80s when you were born, right? And so I, I literally had a friend back then who wanted the same things. I mean, he he and I badly wanted to be great husbands. We badly wanted to be great fathers. So we, we literally would meet once a week uh, on Monday mornings, talk about some of the things that had happened in our homes that week that troubled us that, you know, basically not what our wives did, but what we ourselves did where we, you know, maybe blew it or whatever. And, you know, we would also read the Bible together. And honestly, and I know this will sound like a big stretch to some guys, but we, we literally would take hymn books and we would sing hymns together, just two mm -hmm. guys by ourselves in a back corner of the church singing hymns. Now that sounds, again, like a stretch, but one of the things that did for me, uh, when you can sing out loud with another guy, that's pretty intimate, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, you can talk about anything and you can trust about any distance you need to trust. Now, I'm not saying you need to go find somebody that you can sing with. I'm not trying to say that. The story I'm trying to share is that we were of one heart. Uh, we were one team trying to grow in the same direction. And we were willing to be intimate enough to even sing hymns together uh, and to share, no matter what it meant in our lives, uh, share whatever <laughs> problematic behavior that we did that week. Okay. So that's one. Uh, another thing which Brenda and I recently did uh, is we started a kind of a small group in our home. Uh, we picked five couples that we felt like one day will be leaders in, in the church, not necessarily our church, but they were, they happened to be all from our church. Some of them have moved on by now, but uh, what we did was they were all about the same age, about your age, Jay, and they were raising their kids and all that, had lots of questions. And so I would just develop a little lesson each week. Um, you know, it might be uh, a lesson based upon that scripture about not driving your children to wrath. Uh, it might be a lesson about, um, you know, how to develop character in your children and, and the practical steps, not just talking about it, but the, the literal things that Brenda and I intentionally did to take our kids in a certain direction. Um, and also we were talking about the marriage relationship. So you, you mentioned earlier, Jay, about uh, the relationships that are key. What we wanted to do with them is to teach them how to best have that relationship with each other and then with their kids. And we did that for about two years. Um, we met maybe every six weeks or so. So it's not like it was, gosh, you know how it is. Everybody's so busy. But uh, all of them became our best friends. And it was through that process of meeting as couples where a couple of those guys now, I text fairly regularly, not just asking them how they're doing, but you know, one of them loves Arizona State University, so I'll see something about them and I'll send him a text and laugh at him or 
you know, celebrate with him, whatever the, if I'm making fun of him or if we're celebrating, whatever. The, the big thing is, is we're friends now and um, I can go out and, um, you know, take, a, we can go out to breakfast together and just have a ball. And um, one of the things I've found through these kinds of relationships is that having a good, strong relationship with another man literally makes my relationship with myself better because I feel more like a man. I feel more like um, valued and uh, it strengthens me in knowing that, hey, uh, my dad wasn't right. Uh, my heavenly father was right, that I belong in the world of men and I'm uh, he's proud to have me carry his name, uh, meaning Christian. And so, you know, those are two examples of of relationships where we have intentionally done some things to build relationships and to strengthen the walk of the people in our lives. Does, did you notice, did you notice a change in your temperament as you, as you developed these relationships? We have an idea of sort of how you were in your early marriage, how you were with as an early father. Was there a noticeable change in you as you sort of pursued more of these healthier relationships? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that you also mentioned another relationship, our relationship with God. Um, during all that same time frame, I was learning how to. Uh, what would you say? Worship one on one with the Lord. Um, one of the things I always thought was we only worship in church. That's where worship happens. And it, I was listening to Charles Swin Swindoll one day on the radio, and he had mentioned that he never went into prayer without first worshiping. And I'm just like, it was way beyond my grid work. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I figured he's just a man of God like that with him. He'd like it with me. So I literally began to take, it was a boom box back then and cassettes. So it's been a while ago, but I would take those cassettes, put on worship music, and I would sing three or four songs in this very room that I'm sitting in, walking back and forth in my basement and uh, worshiping the Lord just one-on-one, -on -one, singing out loud to him. And uh, one of the things I found that happened with that is it just exploded my prayer life. I mean, instead of being dry, it became just as lively as could be because I was establishing that relationship with God before I would kind of go in and talk to him, so to say. And so, but one of the most important things that did for me, and, and if anybody wants to know more about this, I, I wrote a full chapter on this in my book, my newest book, Battle On, Battle Over. And you can go to battleonbattleover.com and, and get a copy if you want. But I, I just expressed in detail in that chapter how to go about this. And the big thing that happened to me was not just that I was worshiping and doing what the Bible tells me to do. <laughs> it was really incredible what it did to my actual intimacy with God. So when you tie that intimacy with God that was developing and then the intimacy with men that was developing, oh, yes, uh, both of those side by side were having a big impact on on how I acted. And uh, what I found what I found in my life is that when we are not in good relationship with ourselves and there's a lot of pain or stress there, a lot of times we'll use our lust and uh porn, masturbation, to medicate that pain instead of actually dealing with the pain by maybe going to God with it or going to a counselor. Uh, I think the same thing is true without any question when it comes to anger, uh, because when we're feeling better about ourselves, when we're understanding our relationships and how they're supposed to be with our wives through our relationship with these other men who are also striving for the same thing. I think we just feel better about ourselves. We feel better about the possibilities. And uh, there's not as much stress and anger then in our lives. Um, I know most of the anger that I've ever had in my life, you could trace it back to my relationship with my dad or my dashed expectations about what I wanted in marriage. And um, as those healed, um, then I, I healed in my emotions. Does that make sense, Jay? 
It does. It does. I was, you know, I'm just, it's a, there's a lot to kind of drive, drive home here. And I think that one of the things I thought was really, really interesting here was the, in the example, in the examples of having self-awareness about why you're doing the things that you're doing. What is interesting, because I, I think it, it requires some definition is you went to sources that were responsible for helping you be the best person you could be before you brought it home. A lot of the modern context and the modern understanding of marriage is that that person is everything to you. And as Christians, we understand how that, that can create some issues, right? If your partner, if your marriage, if that person in your life, whether you're the husband or the wife, is everything and has to solve all the problems for you, it's going to create issues with you. We understand this biblically as Christians. Um, uh, but yeah, when we understand you, it from life, right? I mean, we've experienced yeah. it. So I think it was really important to highlight um, that there were certain people on your journey that were helping you with certain things and they were creating a specific space for you. So for instance, there was, you had your relationship with your buddy at church. You had your relationship with your counselor. You had your relationship with God. You had, a ha- you probably had a handful of other relationships that we haven't covered here. Yes. But that all You're of right. these things helped give you an environment, a community, so that those, whatever it was that you were doing, whether it was good times, bad times, whether it was personal development or just fun, were occurring. And then you would go home and you would be ready and complete at home to be your best self at home. Is that a good a good um, summer uh, summary of, of those activities? Yeah. No. Uh, yes, and and I think for those of you that are watching that are Americans, I mean, you know that in America, in our culture, people like John Wayne and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis and some of those guys who uh, they kind of take on the world all by themselves, you know. <laughs> And I don't need in the movies. anybody else. Yeah, in the movies. Yeah, in the movies. And Indiana Jones. I don't need anybody else. I can handle all this myself. Um, that's just not reality. Now we do celebrate that, and and we understand why we celebrate that. As men, um, we all like to think of ourselves as defenders of the beautiful things in our lives, and we're going to put down evil. All those things. But the fact of the matter is, is that community and finding friends is important. Now, in America, as we know, um, in our in our jobs, we tend to move from city to city, and we a lot of times we don't put down roots in a community, uh, literally in a city or something like that, for any length of time. And it's very difficult for us to form those kinds of relationships if we're moving all the time. So there's a a great cost. A lot of times we don't count the cost of a career move when it comes to our relationships and how that's going to affect us as men. But um, even if you are moving around a lot, churches these days, gratefully, are, you know, a lot of them have small group programs and discipleship group programs where you can get plugged in and begin to make new friends in your new place. it's my experience that one of the great problems with men being men and acting like godly men is that they don't have friends uh, and they're not intentional, intentional about finding friends. They may find fellow hunters at work and they may go out and shoot a deer or something, but they don't have anybody that's talking to them about their lust, their anger. Uh, driving their kids to wrath, uh, all the things that we need to be talking about so that we don't get lost in just the day-to-day junk of life, um, the urgent things that drive the important things out. We need to be intentional. Uh, When I said I was meeting with my buddy, it was intentional. We were meeting at 6.30 on Mondays, right? Uh, He had to get up early. I had to get up early, but we knew we were going to be there. That's intentional. Uh, With those couples, we knew, I mean, we scheduled way ahead. Okay, it's going to be August 16th and Brenda's going to make a meal and we're going to have pork chops. So make sure you come. That sort of a thing. And and 
I think intentionality is really, really important. Otherwise, it tends to slip away and we don't do it. And you can already see from our discussion, anybody that's listening, you already see from our discussion that if you don't have friends that are like you and driving in the same direction and wanting to grow in the same direction, it's very difficult to move forward on your own like a John Wayne or Arnold Schwarzenegger. There, It's just not going to happen. I love it. Thank you, Fred. I think we've covered um, an incredible amount of topics. Uh, are there any clo uh, any closing uh, statements or anything that we want to end uh, end our discussion on? No, I would just say, guys, that it's uh, it's really important for you to be rather than to seem right and to live from the inside out. And I would just encourage you to meditate on that, pray about that and move in that direction uh, because being centered uh, in something bigger than you and then teaming up with other men, um, that's going to make all the difference in your life and change your destiny. It really will. Fred, everybody.